Okay, so this is where we were last time, which is a big uh, or the most important target for our uh, course to show that this connection between psi of x and the Riemann hypothesis and how the Riemann hypothesis says something very interesting about the distribution of primes. Now, there are still some loose ends here. One is that uh, uh, we really want to know about pi x. You remember what pi x was? Number of primes less than equal to x, but after that uh, definition of phi, pi x, I switched over to psi x and everything since then has been done in terms of psi of x, which is good, but still ideally would like to uh, extract out some information about pi of x. So, that is one loose end and the second one is uh, something actually is not really a loose end, but it is still it is a very interesting observation that and I mentioned it last time that Riemann hypothesis implies that psi x equal to this. So, that is an implication and since it took us so much time and effort to prove this implication, it might appear that it is a one way implication. But as it turns out, that is not true. If psi x equals this, it implies Riemann hypothesis. So, that is what I am going to show it to you first, because it is very easy proof. So, let us uh, let us uh, let me state the theorem. If psi x equals x plus order So, actually we can prove something stronger here that if psi x is x plus order x to the half plus epsilon for any epsilon greater than 0. I do not even have to assume it is x plus order square root x log square x. I can allow any power of log x or any x to the epsilon as long for any every epsilon greater than 0. Then the Riemann hypothesis holds. <coughs> So, how do we prove this? To prove this, we just go almost all the way back and right in the beginning, if you remember, we derived this expression for zeta prime or zeta. Do you remember what that was? Okay. Let me just refresh your memory. We know that zeta z for real z greater than 1 this is equal to this product prime p 1 over 1 minus 1 over p to the z right this is correct right and now take log and derivative this gives you zeta prime z over zeta z okay this is of course for real z greater than 1. This is equal to log, we will convert this into sum and then derivative will bring down sum over prime p as minus here, then then differentiate this. You get uh, 1 over this, then minus log p over this okay and this is equal to
in fact this is precisely the expression we used um, in that uh, integral to replace this sum by zeta prime over zeta and that is how we got uh, psi related to zeta prime over zeta. Now, what is lambda n? Lambda n equals is log of p if n is p to the m 0 otherwise. Right? That is the definition of lambda n. And what is psi x? psi x equals n less than equal to x summation of lambda n. Okay. So, in other words, I can write lambda n as psi of n minus psi of n minus 1. Triple. And so, let us plug this value in for lambda in the above expression. The next step is to convert this into an integral. So, now rearrange this. Collect psi n terms together. So, what is the coefficient or multiplier to psi n? You get uh, 1 over n to the z here, you get one more. What is that? 1 by n to the z minus 1 by n plus 1 to the z. Anything missing? n equals 1, you have psi 0, yeah, psi 0 is trivial, so you can forget it. So, this is what you get. Now, look at this. So, this is the integral of n to n plus 1 psi t by t to the z plus 1 d t times z. See, in n interval n to n plus 1, psi is constant. So, the psi comes out. Okay. So, you get d t over t to the z plus 1. Its integral is minus t to the z over z. So, that z z cancels out. So, you get 1 minus 1 over t to the z and then n plus 1 to n. So, this minus goes away. How does it? It does not go away. Now, this is good because then you can take this z out and make this from 1 to infinity. Now, keep in mind the real part of z should be greater than 1. Now, since we have psi t equals t plus order t to the half plus epsilon, we get zeta prime z over zeta z to be z minus of course. 1 to infinity t plus order t to the z plus 1 d t. So, the first term just gives you minus z 1 to infinity 
d t over t to the z and the second term Okay, now what does first term say? See, real z is greater than one, right? So first term will converge. What does it converge to? Well, it converges to. Sorry. So this is basically minus z. This is what is z? One over z minus one. T to the minus z so t to the right. when uh, t is infinity and real z is uh, greater than 1 that vanishes this part vanishes when t is 1 then you get uh, negative negative t is 1 so you get Now, let us look at uh, 0 prime over 0 and this expression. The expression on right hand side is analytic as long as real z is greater than half, actually greater than half half plus epsilon. Because then this part will become real part of this will become more than 1 and then this integral converges. This is analytic except for pole at z equals 1 real z equals z equals 1. So, except for pole at z equals 1. So, that is right hand side. Left hand side is zeta prime or zeta. We know that by our analysis for real z greater than 1 left hand side equals right hand side. Now, by again analytic continuation z zeta prime or zeta is equal to right hand side for real z greater than half plus epsilon. Fine. Now, the right hand side except for pole at already I am saying this except for pole at z equals 1 is analytic everywhere on real z greater than half plus epsilon. And this is true for any epsilon because of my our assumption was for any epsilon <coughs> uh, psi of x is order x to the half plus epsilon. What does it mean? It means that 0 prime or zeta is also analytic for any z such that real z 0 prime over zeta is analytic for except for pole at Well, we already know it has a pole at z equals 1, but if the Riemann hypothesis was not true and there was which means that there is a 0 of z, zeta at real z more than half, 
then zeta prime or zeta will have a pole there, which will contradict this statement. Okay. Therefore, It's extremely simple, right? It's a ten-minute proof. I got lost somewhere; otherwise, I would have finished it more quickly. The other direction, of course, took forever, and both sort of arise from the same idea. That is, this expression for zeta prime over zeta. You have this expression, and for psi, you have this sum. Psi of x is partial sum of these, and so that's this do have a very nice entire relationship. In fact, later on in this course, which is our next uh, step, once I am done with all of this, uh, in the remaining lecture what I will do is two things. One is to generalize this. So, there is this, I mean if you look at it from a higher level, psi x is a partial sum of some quantities then zeta prime over zeta in our case, but in general some other function zeta prime over zeta is this infinite sum with same quantities in a numerator and n to the z in the denominator. Right? So, this is zeta prime over zeta lambda n over n to the z for all n psi x is sum n less than equal to x lambda n and there is this relationship. So, one is a complex plane object one is a number theoretic object and there is a we did all this work to establish this nice relationship between this. Now, it turns out that we this we can we can do not only for lambda n, but many other numbers and there is the entire theory which has been developed on this and there is really some real remarkable result which I will only be able to give you a very brief glimpse. I do not either have time nor uh, full understanding to explain all of that to you, but uh, this is essentially the starting point for uh, the theory of modular forms. So, these some of the objects called modular forms, which I will define at some point, which are uh, functions of the kind of the with properties like zeta function and there is a whole beautiful theory around this and not just theory we one can use this this different forms to derive different number theoretic results just as we did for zeta function okay that's the one direction the second thing i would like you to show I hopefully i'll have time to do that is at least one domain in which we can prove Riemann hypothesis. You cannot prove Riemann hypothesis over for this complex plane of this kind, but as I said we can do now that we after abstracting out the basic ideas we can take this relationship of number theoretic functions and complex analytic functions in form of different kind and form the relationship with them and you know pose the same similar hypothesis make the similar hypothesis about that those com, uh, complex analytic function about where the zeros lie and relate them to the properties of these number theoretic functions. So, we can come up with various versions of Riemann hypothesis. Now, most of those versions remain unproven conjectured but unproven, but some versions have been proven. So, I will give you one example which also not in its own very interesting example which is uh, of elliptic curves. So, again certain number theoretic objects the elliptic curves are thought of as some number theoretic objects and then we can associate a corresponding Riemann hypothesis with these objects or other some certain numbers associated with these objects and then prove that Riemann hypothesis. Okay. But before we do all of this I still have to tie a few more things here one is the psi x versus pi x that business and the second thing I want to do before we move forward is to prove 
a basic version of you know, not quite Riemann hypothesis, but something uh, let us say the starting point towards proof, which is what I will prove is that on the line real z equals 1, there are no zeros of zero function. And that is enough to prove prime number theorem, because that means that the error is uh, in psi x, it is psi a of x is x plus order x to the 1 minus delta for some tiny, tiny delta. Essentially, that error term cannot cancel out x and that is uh, that proves the prime number theorem. Okay. Good and as it turns out all of these are very easy, so I can do that quickly. So, let us investigate this psi and pi. Psi we know what it is, pi we know what it is. So, how do you write one in terms of another? See what or how does psi x get calculated? You go through all the numbers in sequence, whenever you detect a prime power, you add log p. Pi x get uh, constructed whenever you see a prime, you add 1. So, the calculation of psi x I can divide it as follows I can uh, split it into stages. Stage 1 only con consider primes, whenever you see a prime, add a log p. Stage 2 consider prime powers, whenever you see a prime power p square, add a log p, and that log p therefore is I can instead of talking of log p, I will talk in terms of the number that you see. Whenever you see n to be prime, add log n. Whenever you see n to be a prime power, add half of log n, log, log of root n which is half log n. Whenever you third stage is whenever you see n to be a prime cube, add one third of log n. Okay. Now, how many uh, such uh, uh, things you add. I mean, how many primes you will see? You will see exactly pi x primes. For each one of those primes, you will add log n. How many prime squares will you see? Pi of root x, exactly. You will see exactly pi of root x prime squares. Similarly, you will see exactly pi of third root of x prime cubes, right. And for so for each prime square, you have to add half of log n. So, this thing I can now let us just do it this way. So, you add for each prime in psi, you add log n, but if I derive divide psi, so I am varying psi and whenever I see a change in psi, it is because either I have seen a prime there or I have seen a prime square there or a prime cube there or prime fourth power, right. So, and that point I add appropriate logarithmic term. So, instead of uh, I can alternately state it the way, whenever I see a change in psi and divide at t, if I see a change in psi, and I divide that by log t. Then either I, I could in stage 1 I will be counting all primes, in stage 2 I will be counting half of pi of square root x. One third of pi of x to the one third. So, this is equal to I have to go through numbers in sequence t starting from 1 and notice change in psi t. At whichever t there is a change in psi t, that point I have to divide it by log t. 
Okay. So, this is captured by this integral. Of course, I had to now define this a little more formally, because psi is not a continuous function. So, it is just uh, well, it is continuous, but it is not differentiable. It has the step like quality, but we can define the this d of psi x as measuring the the delta value. So, between psi of d d of psi t is um, well as t varies. Okay, let's be right for d psi t. is 0 most of the time and it becomes lambda t at t equals integer. See at integral points there may be a jump inside. So, at that point of course, this is it's an instantaneous jump. So, I will just fudge around this meaning of this integral or uh, this diff uh, differential d of psi t to mean that at around integ integer d of this is measuring that jump amount of the jump and the jump is exactly by lambda of t and everywhere else it is 0. So, this is not quite the uh, original meaning of differential this is called Stiglitz integral there is a mathematician was a mathematician called Stiglitz lots of i j's in that spelling who uh, defined this first and actually formally analyzed them and proved uh, in what situations uh, is this a sensible definition. And then you, because this allows you uh, to work with a larger class of functions even those which are uh, you know, step wise functions as long as it is continuous not necessarily differentiable we can work with this such function. Okay. So, that is the meaning we will assume here and one of the things that he showed was that uh, we can given the reasonably decent condition on psi of x psi of t we can assume this to be functioning almost exactly as a normal differential and as again psi of t does satisfy those conditions or a fairly mild condition it should not be sort of jumping up it should not be function which will jumps up and down it is a monotonically going up function and so some simple properties which as long as they are satisfied you get. Okay want a new page. Hmm. Oh, insert. Okay. Oh, it is entered here. Bizarre. What do I do about this? Select all, cut paste. Okay, now we have a free page here. And before we run into similar problems, let us insert some more pages. Okay. So, now you see this integral and think of this as a normal integral. All the more so, because now I have a nice expression for psi t, psi t is, is t plus orders some error. So, let psi t be t plus order 
square root t and then let me put uh, another function of t, that is a delta of t. Then let us just first look at this integral going from 1 to x d psi t over log t, this is equal to Now, d psi t I can with this expression for psi t I can write it as psi prime d t, just divide and multiply by, by d t. And so, now you take differential of psi t with respect to t, you get 1 plus order. What happens here? You get uh, t to the minus half delta t plus t to the half delta prime t. And d t goes. Now, look at the first one, what is that? It is your log t integral from 1 to x. That is x over log x, or at least very close to being x over log x. How do you show this? This looks should be simple enough d t over log t integral. Does not this have a closed form formula? Integral log 1 over log t. No? Okay, we will we'll tackle that later. Let us let's look at the error part. What happens here? So, this is a, see maybe just to make life easier, let me stick a, okay, let us keep it delta t and let us assume for the moment. delta t is log square t, which comes out of the Riemann hypothesis. So, then your 1 to x t to the minus half delta t this equals delta t is uh, log square t. So, t to the minus half log t delta prime t is 2 log t by t. So, this becomes previous integral can be done by integration by parts. Sure, because there is a one sitting here. I mean, that's where log t becomes zero. So it diverges. It becomes a little funny integral to handle. But there is some I'm very simple trick which allows us to do that. What happens here? So this delta prime, as I said, was two log t over t. So this becomes log t. So that's two t to the minus of dt. 
clearly the first is uh, bigger than the second one and since we are bounding the error we can ignore the second one and uh, then what is 1 to x log t over t square root t d t what is this okay we are again in similar situation are we maybe not maybe not this we do integration by parts because here log t is up uh, integrates 1 over square root t so what you get is root t by half so you get 2 root t log t 1 to x same thing and log t differentiate when you differentiate you get 1 over t. So, you get 2 by root t d t right. Now, you see that this is of course, again if you integrate this you get just about root t which is again dominated by this and this is basic all of it is order x to the half log x. So, that is what the error and the main part it should turn out this is basically where is it this is x by log x plus some small order term which gets absorbed into the error. So, it should actually uh, what I want to see here is basically x by log x plus order square root x log x that is what should come out. Okay, model of that integral. I maybe I can leave that as an assignment to you. And yes. Yes. Yeah. How does it? Oh, so because see, it's saying it's less than equal to this, right? Uh, okay. Integral by parts actually works, it gives you half x y w because uh, the second the second part after the minus sign you will get back exactly the same integral, it will be y by y. You get back the same thing? Why do you get half x y? It should get half x y, it should x by log x. Okay, but your point is good, yes. Why have I replaced psi by this order? is actually not true that we cannot use. Yes, psi is this t plus order this, but I cannot then therefore write psi prime is 1 plus order this derivative, because all this is saying is that psi is in this band, it grows like t and then there are fluctuations within this given by this error, but those fluctuations may make the derivative of psi very large depending on how those fluctuations happen. Good point. So, I think this whole derivation is wrong. Okay. I will need to think about it then. I thought I can do it in this simple way, but whatever eventual derivation is, it is going to throw up this x by log x plus order square root x log x. And that is equal to this left hand side, which is pi x plus half of pi square root x plus one third of pi x to the one third and so on. Okay. Now, what we certainly know is that pi, what is pi of square root x? Pi 
it said mu square root x. Pi of was x to the one third is at most x to the one third, right? So, whatever the pi x is, the rest of the sum just gets absorbed into the error term. Order square root x times something, three times square root x, four times square root. That's all. Just gets sucked into there. So, left hand side is pi x plus order square root x. Right hand side is x pi log x plus order square root x log uh, log x. So, this is equal to pi x plus order square root x. The right hand side this will be equal to x by log x. This is assuming Riemann hypothesis. And in general, if you do not assume in Riemann hypothesis, you will get delta x by log x. So, whatever is the assumption about psi x for you that it is order x to the half times delta x, you just divide by log x, this is what the error term you will get. And just put these two together, you will see that pi x equals x by log x plus order square root x delta x by log x. And now, if delta x is log square x as given by Riemann hypothesis, then you get square root x log x. So, that is the relationship between these two. So, the only thing I need to now sort out is how do you show this for the right hand side. Okay.